Mm -hmm. And I'm going to be uh, recording only this part of the presentation and not the, not the, the examination questions. And uh, so welcome everyone to uh, Beanhan's uh, defense. And um, uh, you may know that uh, Beanhan is a, is a mechanical engineering uh, student, PhD student who started in 2016 in, a, in my lab. So I'm his main advisor. And he has uh, spent his time uh, working in, in, in three main areas. Uh, one is uh, more theoretical um, and, and, um, uh, and addresses the control, the, the, the control of uh, amplification, uh, strength amplification using exoskeletons. Another one is, uh, uh, and then also theory for, for safety control. And safety control can be either related to exoskeletons or can be also for uh, human-robot interaction with robotic systems. Um, he has also uh, worked in data collection of humans, specifically for validating uh, muscle models. Muscle models, not in a bio biomechanical sense, but more as a controls variable. So you, when you are wearing a robotic system, you need you need the muscles. You need you need to know the response of the muscles, and um, and then he has also worked on um, experimentation using elbow and knee uh, and knee exoskeletons. Uh, and finally, he has collaborated extensively with uh, with students, both uh, within my lab but also with uh, other labs as well. And he has helped a lot uh, master students, for instance, to publish their research. So. Um, uh, don't want to go farther than this. So that said, let's get ahead and have Binghan start his presentation. All right. Thank you for the introduction, Luis. So um, yeah, I'll go ahead to start my presentation. So hey, this is Binghan. So today I'm going to introduce my dissertation for human-centered robots. So first of all, what is a human-centered robot? Human-centered robots, they are specific type of service robot which interact with human physically or cognitively. They try to assist us with tasks in the uncertain environment. So the human-centered robot, they can be human noise, exoskeletons, or just manipulator or mobile platforms, which aim to provide us good services. To understand what is the state of art for human-centered robot, let me compare them with the industrial robots, which are so successful and productive nowadays. So the industrial robot, they have very precise control in position and timing, while the human-centered robots nowadays are still less efficient for us to use. This is because a lot of the human input the human-centered robots rely on are immeasurable or uncertain or even completely unknown. The safety requirement for the industrial robot is very straightforward because the object in their test environment is basically rigid and static. While the human-centered robots, they're facing much more complicated safety requirement because humans are much more dynamical and vulnerable compared to the plastics and metal materials in our factories. So my dissertation aims to improve both the responsiveness and the safety for human-centered robots. For responsiveness, I invented a new human dynamic model, which significantly reduced the human model uncertainty. And based on this new model, we can develop a robot controller with a better performance during the physical human robot interaction. For safety, I developed a new safety control algorithm, which deal with different types of safety constraints. In particular, my safety control algorithm guaranteed a safe robot operation, even under the human force intervention. So first, let me start to introduce how I'm going to improve the responsiveness for human-centered robots. So in this part of my dissertation, I'm going to use amplification exoskeletons as examples for human-centered robots. As you may think, exoskeletons can be very fancy power shoe like this, and they're very typical human-centered robots while they're physically human-centered, as you can see. And the amplification exoskeleton, in particular, they measure the human contact force and provide an amplified version of it such that a human operator can carry heavy load very easily. This helps us in the factory to prevent the back injury of the factory worker, and back injury actually cause the, cause the 
cost us a lot of money each year in the United States. Well, controlling amplification exoskeleton actually is difficult because human is an uncertain time varying system. If we do not take care of the human dynamic properly, the exoskeleton can easily be unstable, just like this video shows. To have a better understanding what is the exact problem from human dynamics, let me use this one dot physical human robot in the action model, where we model the human impedance as a mass spring damper system. Here's the exoskeleton inertia, and we assume the contact between the human and exoskeleton is rigid. So the stiffness of human is time varying, and it can be modified by the muscle con Muscle, co muscle contractions of human, and it can also be modified by the external forces exerted on a human. The damping value of human is also time varying, but however, its correlation with the time varying human stiffness was not so clear for a long time. The initial, you may think it is a constant value, but actually it is not, because the human going to change its configuration, their configurations during the motion. But you can use the human configuration to back calculate this inertia value. So therefore, we are actually, so since both the stiffness and the damping of human impedance are time varying, we're actually facing a two-dimensional uncertainty for the, from the human for each human joint. This will make our controller design so difficult, and we usually get a very low performance controller because of this huge model uncertainty. So, the first contribution on my dissertation is to reduce the uncertainty of human such that we can develop a better robot controller. Just like this video shows, we want to use a good robot controller such that this exoskeleton test bed can track the human motion and carry this heavy load, and we do not need to worry about the stability issue like the previous video. So I have spent a long time to talk about what is the amplification exoskeleton. But actually, the amplification factor alpha can be considered as a proportional gain for controlling the contact force tau c between the human and the exoskeleton. So in order to improve the tracking performance of this contact force control, we're going to do an in-depth study of the human impedance. Here, I'm introducing you a 10-subject human study we have done. And we regulate the stiffness value of the human subject by applying a bias torque to, from the robot to the human subject, and also apply, also let the human subject to apply certain amount of force through an adjustable hand grip. This is because the human stiffness is mainly dependent on the external forces and internal muscle co-contractions. And in this table, I'm showing you three experimental, three groups of experimental setting. Each, each group represents a different human stiffness regulated by this bias torque setting and hand grip setting. And because all this experiment setting have gone to give us a human impedance with different natural frequency, we also apply perturbation signals with different frequency to correctly capture those natural frequencies. And inside each experimental group, we also wonder how the human impedance react to different human perceived inertia. Therefore, we apply different amplification factor alpha such that, and based on this amplification, this amplification factor going to define how much the human feels about the load of the exoskeleton. So we use the perturbation method and we gather the time data and we transfer this time data into frequency domain. And here are the body plots. But before I tell you the result of our model identification, we were surprised when we see this body plot. The first thing is, you can see, although this body plot shift up and down and left and right, this is because we test different human stiffness value and the different inertia that human feels about. But however, the shape of this body plot for one subject is, all, is almost the same. And what defines the shape of the body plot for second order system is the damping ratio. So we have the suspicion that for, us, for the same subject, we have, the, we have almost like a constant. We were surprised is here. 
None of this phase body plot start from the zero degrees at its very low frequency. And our intuition tells us this is actually a nonlinear system behavior. And we shouldn't expect to identify it using a linear model. Let me further explain my concern here. So in the very beginning, we want to use this very famous linear mass spring damper model to represent the impedance of human. This model has one problem. Both the stiffness and the damping, both the stiffness and damping are time varying. Therefore, we're facing a two-dimensional uncertainty and the controller design is so difficult using this model. But however, now it seems this model is also wrong because it failed to explain the low frequency phase shift behavior in this phase body plot. But it turns out this kind of low frequency nonlinear behavior can be better explained using a hysteretic damping term instead of a conventional linear damping term. And if we take a look at this hysteretic damping term, it is an imaginary value in the frequency domain. Together with this real value, which is the human stiffness, we call our new model the complex stiffness model. If we take a look at the damping ratio of this new model, it will be the hysteretic damping parameter over two times this human stiffness value. Therefore, if we can identify a linear relationship between these two parameters, we can actually explain why the human subject can maintain a consistent damping ratio versus different stiffness and environmental inertia. But before we try to find a correlation between these two parameters, there's another problem we need to answer. We need to compare whether is this new hysteretic damping term more significant or the conventional linear damping term more significant from our test result. Therefore, we create a third model, which is a combination of the other two models. So by conducting model comparisons between model one and model three, and between model two and model three, we'll be able to tell which damping term is more significant. And our hypothesis for this human subject study is, the newly invented hysteretic damping term going to measure well the human impedance behavior and it's gonna be more significant than the conventional linear damping term from our result. So let's go back to this body plot. We use this frequency domain data to fit all three models such that we can identify the parameters. And the fit and the dash line here actually is the, are the fitted curve using model three. You can see it fit the low frequency pretty well, and this is all because of the additional hysteretic damping in it. So after we fit this model, we're going to conduct a model comparison through the F-test. The F-test is calculated based on the residual square sum from our model fitting. We want to compare the model for each individual subject across all nine experiment settings, and for each experimental setting, across all 10 subjects, and for all the subjects and experiment setting overall. Here, the plot is showing you our statistic result for the F-test. The red bar showing you the F-test between model one and model three. The blue bar shows you the result between model two and model three. And this solid line shows up if there is an F-test value, which is higher than the threshold of 5% post-rejection probability. So if the red bar is higher than the threshold, then we basically cannot ignore the hysteretic damping in this comparison. If the blue bar is higher than the threshold, then we cannot ignore the linear damping in this comparison. So based on this result, we can see almost all the subjects shows a more significant for the hysteretic damping than the linear damping, except for subject A. Experimental wise, we can see also, the hysteretic damping is much more significant than the linear damping for all the experimental settings. Overall, although we still have a small effect from the linear damping in our result, but the hysteretic damping is much more significant. So based on this model comparison, we can accept the fact that the hysteretic damping do play an important role in human impedance. And now let's talk about the correlation between the hysteretic damping and the stiffness in our complex stiffness model. Actually, the ratio between these two parameters is also called a hysteretic damping loss factor from the field of structural mechanics. So if we take a look at this term, 
If this term is a constant value, then both the damping ratio and the low frequency phase shift of the human subject will be constant value. So in order to find out a correlation between these two parameters, we conduct a linear regression in a log-log scale between these two parameters. This will give us a power law relationship. This beta zero value is the intercept of the regression line, and this beta one value is the slope of the regression line. And here, the three plots showing you the regression results from to our most representative subject and the geometric subject, the geometric average across all the subjects. The ellipsoids here showing you the covariance for the average. So from this regression line, and also this table showing you all the regression results for every subject, we can see the I squared, the R squared value for the regression line are pretty high. Therefore, the power law we identify here is pretty reliable. So if this beta one value, which is the slope of the regression line, is exactly one, then the hysteretic damping loss factor will be a perfect constant value. But however, if you take a look at this result, the beta one value for some subject is slightly smaller than one, for some subject is slightly higher than one. But mainly, all these values are very close to one. So this helps us to explain why the damping ratio and the phase shift for a human subject varies in a small range. But no matter what beta one value we have, we already obtain a relationship that we can use the stiffness term, stiffness value to represent the hysteretic damping value. Therefore, we obtain a one parameter complex stiffness model. Uh, this one parameter is the human stiffness parameter. Therefore, we reduce the two dimensional uncertainty from the conventional mass spring damper model to the one dimensional uncertainty to our new complex stiffness model. So we have found this new model with the reduced human uncertainty. Then the next question is how are we going to define a new controller using this new model? Well, so let's take a look at the transfer function of the amplification exoskeleton. And here I'm showing you the conceptual body plot of the plant. From the low frequency to the high frequency, we first have a pair of toes at the natural frequency of human wearing the exoskeleton. And then we have a pair of zeros at the natural frequency of human alone. And then we have an, another pair of zeros at the natural frequency of the actuator. So if we apply a very high value amp of amplification, which is because of we want to achieve high performance from the exoskeleton, the gain crossover is going to naturally fall beyond the natural frequency of the actuator. This frequency range is actually dominated by the contact sensor noise. And the phase margin is also quite small here. Therefore, if we directly close the loop for this case, the system will be unstable and also amplifying the sensor noise. So we definitely want to maintain the stability of our system and achieve the highest bandwidth as possible. Therefore, the next frequency range we can consider is between the natural frequency of human alone and the natural frequency of the actuator. But since both of these two second order subsystems are under them, therefore, if we make a crossover in this frequency region, we're going to have two additional crossover, one out of each side in this frequency. Out, one out of each side of this frequency region. Therefore, we need to shift our crossover to even lower frequency to obtain the stability of operation. So in order to do that, we can use a PI controller, which shifts the crossover and eliminates the steady state arrow. And here, the plus is using the green line, the red line showing you the original plan. The blue, the green line shows you our PI controller, and the blue line shows you our plan with the PI controller. But however, using this PI controller, we also have one problem. This PI controller sacrifices a lot of the gain between the very low frequency to the crossover frequency. This means the robot will have poor tracking performance for, 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 the, for those frequencies. And if if the human operator moves very fast, our exoskeleton system is not going to properly respond to it. So is there a way we can further improve the tracking performance for these frequencies? 
Let's go back to the transfer function of our plan. Actually, because of the complex stiffness, we have a phase shift from minus 180 degrees between the natural frequency of human lung and the natural frequency of human wearing the exoskeleton. And if we make a crossover in this frequency region, we actually have a guarantee phase margin and guarantee phase margin value, which is a hysteretic damping, is, which is a complex stiffness phase shift value. But however, if we still use a PI controller, we still have a problem because the integral term of the PI controller have 90 degrees phase shift. And this 90 degrees is much higher than the phase shift than the phase shift of the complex stiffness. Therefore, the PI controller still turn the system to be unstable. Then the question is, can we come up with a controller which has a phase shift lower than 90 degrees? The answer is yes, but not with a linear controller. In fact, it's gonna be a fractional order controller. And because of its fractional order, it had a phase shift between zero degrees and 90 degrees. If we, can, if we take a look at the magnitude plot of the fractional order controller, the plan actually have a boosted, boosted gain between the low frequency and the crossover frequency because of this fractional order. Then the next question is, how are we going to, in, how are we going to define the value of this fractional order? I want to say it is subject dependent. Well, certainly we don't want our system to have exactly zero phase margin. Therefore, we need to consider a minimum phase margin phi here. And here, the phase shift of the complex stiffness is, is basically dependent on the hysteretic damping loss factor. And this hysteretic damping loss factor from our human subject study, for some subject, this value has this maximum value with the upper bound of the human stiffness. And for some subject, is the opposite. So does it mean we need to pass the complex stiffness model for every human operator before we design the controller for them? Well, let's take, let's go back to the equation of this fractional order controller. This fractional order controller actually only have one tuning parameter, which is this fractional order. And the critical value of this fractional order only occur either at the upper bound of the human stiffness or the lower bound of the human stiffness. Therefore, even without a full, full complex stiffness model of the human operator, we can still easily hand tune this controller. To show you how we tune this controller, I'm going to pick three most representative subjects from our study. Subject B had the highest beta one value. So her is the radical damping loss factor increased dramatically with the stiffness value. So we set a hand grip force setting and the bias torque setting for her to achieve low stiffness and high stiffness. And then we start to tune our fractional order controller from a fractional order of zero. And then we gradually, and then we add this fractional order till we reach the point, till we reach the, till we reach the fractional order of 0.27, her low stiffness case start to vibrate, but her high stiffness case is still stable. This is all because of her hysteretic damping loss factor equation. And therefore, this fractional order will be her maximum fractional order. Subject D has a fractional, has the hysteretic damping loss factor, which is almost like a constant. Therefore, when we reach the fractional order, which is 0.56, both her low stiffness case and high stiffness case start to vibrate. Subject G had the lowest beta one value among all the subjects. So when we reach the fractional order of 0.22, his low stiffness case is still fully stable, but his high stiffness case start to vibrate. And based on this tuning, based on these tuning processes, we obtain the maximum fractional order from all three subjects. And we subtract a 0.12 from all those fractional order such that we can obtain an additional 10 degrees phase margin which make the system robustly, robustly stable. And using this new fraction order, we ask the subject to swing their arm up and down with a one radians per second motion and a 10 radians 
Pasenga motion, and then we measure the amplification factor, the exoskeleton and chief. And actually, I want to emphasize the result here. This 10 radians per second motion is actually 10 radians per second is much faster than one hertz. And even that, even at that high speed, the amp amplification exoskeleton can still provide a larger amount of forces to help the human operator. Therefore, using this new model and this new control strategy, we can significantly improve the performance and responsiveness of the exoskeleton. So I will show you how we do all those, um, how we use the complex stiffness uh, model to help us to develop controller. So you might wonder how this new model works for other human joints and other uh, robotic systems. And here in this video, I implement a controller in this leg exoskeleton, and Lewis is first using his hand to feel the original weight of it. You can see it's pretty heavy, and then Lewis just used one finger to grab the force sensor at the very bottom, and Lewis's strength is soon amplified after he touched the sensor. And of course, since it is a leg exoskeleton, I try to wear it, and you see how fast I can swing this heavy exoskeleton using my leg. And I also push against my leg to achieve a high, high leg impedance to test the stability. In this work led by my former colleague, Ray Thomas, we also use a complex stiffness model to develop a different type of joint impedance control, uh, joint, joint controller for this lower body exoskeleton. And you say it helps the human operator to carry the load and and climb the stairs. And the history, the complex stiffness not just give us the potentials to develop good controllers, but it also helped the human to, since this complex stiffness give the human the consistent damping ratio, human can maintain the same trajectory, uh, trajectory smoothness across different inertia they are, they are holding. So can robot have the same good feature like a human. So if we can, if we go back to the complex stiffness model, it is actually a frequency domain model. And the time domain representation of complex stiffness have this term, which is a Hilbert transformation of the motion. And the Hilbert transformation is actually non-causal equation, which requires us to know the future information of the motion. Therefore, we cannot implement the hysteretic damping in the time domain exactly because of this non-causality. But however, in 1956, Reed came up with this new model, which is causal approximation of the complex stiffness. And in this project led by my former colleagues, colleague Nicholas Bresno, we successfully implement we successfully implement the complex stiffness based on a similar idea of Reed's model in this single joint robotic cast bed. And you can see the, joint, the time response of this joint position actually reached the same amount of overshoot, although we changed the robot load dramatically. So I have shown you my result of uh, developing new human dynamic model and develop new controller for improving the responsiveness for human-centered robots. So far, the robot I have been talking about, they are basically strict followers for human. And for this type of robots, they basically rely on the human themselves to obey the safety constraint, except for stability. But a more reliable, but more, a more re reliable human-centered robot should actively prevent us from the potential risks. Therefore, in the second part, I'm going to talk about a new safety control algorithm which guarantee the, the safe robot operation during the physical human robot in action. So let me first give you some literature review. Safe robot trajectory can be synthesized using the quadratic programming method subject to some control barrier function constraints. We can also use a LQR tree method, which is a combination of a shooting trajectory with some stabilizing controller through the LQR method. But this method originally, they are originally designed for convex state, state, state space problem. But if we have obstacles in the workspace of the robot, 
we're actually facing a non-convex state space problem, which cannot be handled by this method. In addition, some of this method also cannot handle the input constraint of the robot. If the robot reaches the input saturation, we no longer guarantee the safety. Therefore, we're looking for a safety control algorithm which can both guarantee, which can both deal with the non-convex state space constraint and also the robot input constraint. The non-convex constraint, we can use sampling-based method, such as the probabilistic roadmap methods or the rapidly exploring random tree method. This method will give us the waypoints which guide us from an initial position to a goal position. But however, this method does not, these methods do not give us feedback control policies. And without the feedback control policy, we cannot guarantee the safe transition between two waypoints, especially under the human force intervention. Therefore, our control algorithm also need to provide feedback control policies. Before I introduce my proposed method, let me first uh, let me first talk about two concepts I need to use for my proposed method. The first one is a barrier pair. A barrier pair is a pair of a barrier function and a feedback control policy. While we are using this feedback control policy, the sublevel set of this barrier pair becomes an invariant set. While we are inside this invariant set, both the state space constraint and the input constraint are satisfied. There are many approaches which can give us a pair of functions to satisfy these two properties. If we just consider a quadratic barrier function and a full state feedback and full state feedback control policy, the, we will obtain an ellipsoidal region of attraction and our barrier pair synthesis problem will become a linear matrix in product problem. I will introduce you this barrier pair synthesis problem later. Let me talk about the other concept I need to use. I need to borrow the concept of RRT here. Let me just record the three key steps of RRT algorithm in each iteration. We sample a random configuration. We find the nearest vertex in the existed RRT graph. We expand the graph toward a random configuration with a distant delta with a constant distance delta at each iteration. And based on the RRT and barrier pairs, I can introduce you my proposed control algorithm, which is a RRT of barrier pairs. Let me call it BPRT. So we start from the goal region where we want the robot to go to, and then we synthesize one barrier pair subject to its local convex constraint. Inside the boundary of this first barrier pair, we synthesize the, another equilibrium point and then another and synthesize, we, we sample another equilibrium point and synthesize another barrier pair subject to its nearby state space constraint. And inside the boundaries of all the existing barrier pairs, we sample another equilibrium point and sample another barrier pair. Uh, and, and create another barrier pair. And this process continues to we find one barrier pair, which covers the entire initial region. Then we get a sequence of barrier pairs, which bring us from the initial region to the goal region without going through any of these obstacle regions. So in each iteration, we sample a new equilibrium point and we decompose the non-convex non-convex state space constraint into some local state local convex state space constraint. And then we use a barrier pair to handle this local convex constraint and also the robot input constraint. And this barrier pair automatically give us the feedback control policy. To explain you how I'm going to synthesize barrier pair for BPRT, let me start talk about the dynamics of a robot. Here is the Lagrangian, uh, Lagrangian dynamics of the, of the robot with a uh, joint Configure, joint configuration vector Q and the joint input vector U. So it's Cartesian space, Cartesian workspace vector Y can be calculated using a forward kinematics equation. And this, and this, works, this Cartesian workspace vector can be considered as the output of a state space equation of the robot dynamics. Because we're going to use a linear matrix inequality method to synthesize the barrier pair, 
we first need to have a linear version of the robot dynamics. Therefore, we can linearize the robot dynamics around a sample equilibrium point, which will give us a state, linear state space equation. But however, this linearized model will become invalid if the robot configuration start to deviate from this equilibrium point. A solution to this issue is to consider a bounded state space region Z, and we calculate, and this bounded state space, re, this bounded state space region Z is centered at the sample equilibrium point. And then we can calculate the bounded uncertainty of the robot dynamics for all the states inside this bounded state space region Z. And then we can, we can calculate this bounded uncertainty using a quadratic inclusion program method. This will give us a norm bound linear model instead of a regular linear model, which become invalid if it deviates from the equilibrium point. So after up to, so the next question is how are we going to define this region Z? Well, the obstacles near the sample equilibrium point will give us some local state space, local constraints for the robot, uh, robot position. And we also need to consider the velocity constraint for each joint of the robot. And this position constraint and velocity constraint together will give us the full definition of this Z region. And for the barrier pair synthesis problem, we also need to consider the input constraint of each robot joint. And then we turn this position, velocity, and input constraint into linear matrix inequalities. Together with another linear matrix inequality, which enforces the Lyapunov stability of the robot, then we can create our barrier pair synthesis problem. This barrier pair synthesis problem with a cost function, which try to maximize the volume of the ellipsoidal region of attraction. Through this method, we can synthesize the barrier pairs. Now the next question is how we expand the BPRT graph. If you recall the three key steps of RT, sample a random configuration, find the nearest vertex in the existing graph, and expand the graph, the BPRT algorithm has something similar. But the difference is instead of expand the graph with a constant distance delta in each iteration, we actually project a randomly sampled configuration back to a hypersurface, which is strictly inside the boundary of the nearest barrier pair. This will guarantee the newly sampled equilibrium point is already inside the boundary of the existing barrier pair. Therefore, if we synthesize a new barrier pair, the transition from this new barrier pair to its nearest barrier pair is guaranteed to be safe. So let, in order to prove this concept, I'm going to use this two dot manipulator to to explain how we, how we use this BBRT algorithm. So this, so we consider some bounded robot input constraint here. And we want the robot N factors to start from this A1 region and infinitely often visit A1, A2, and A3 region, but without having the N factor going any of this shadow region. So we just need to use the barrier RT algorithm to synthesize barrier pairs, barrier pair sequences from region one to region two, from region two to region three, and from region three back to region one, and let them run in this order continuously. And here is the video of the trace execution. The bigger the big ellipsoid is showing you the boundary of one barrier pair, while the cross at the center is the equilibrium point of that barrier pair. So every time the end factor starts from near the boundary of, of one barrier pair and tries to go to the center. But before it reaches the center, it actually goes into the next barrier pair. And therefore, the barrier pair sequences successfully guide the robot end factor to move between these three, three regions and without having the end factor make goes into any of these shadow regions. Since I'm talking about my research for human-centered human -centered robots, and in the previous example, we don't have human. So let's bring the human back to the loop. Here, let's consider 
a human robot share autonomy scenario where we have a human operator using where, where we have a human operator push the end factor of the robot in order to tell the robot where to go. And we want the robot to use the bare repairs to successfully, to successfully execute the task defined by the human. But different from the previous example, in the previous example, we directly gave the go region to the robot and the robot just need to execute it. Here, the robot actually need to use the human force input to estimate the direction, to, to estimate where the human really wants to go. And sometimes human can really give a force, which, for example, pointing between two regions. And this kind of human command is super ambiguous. Therefore, we need to have the algorithm to correct, to properly handle the human intentional inference. Therefore, we first build a likelihood, fun likelihood function, which is in terms of the inner product of the human force direction and the, a vector which pointed toward one of the candidate human objective region. And based on this likelihood function, we use a Bayesian method to update our belief of where the human wants the robot to go to. And based on the value of this belief, we can pick our guest human objective. And this, human, this guest human objective, you're going to tell us which barrier pair sequences we're going to trigger in the low level. And here, actually, we need to assume that a human is give a bounded input. Otherwise, there's no safety guarantee you can guarantee with an unbounded external input. But because of this bounded human input, the barrier pair is no longer converging to the equilibrium point exactly. Instead, it's going to converge to a residual set, which is a smaller ellipsoidal region centered at the equilibrium point. Therefore, if we want to guarantee the safe transition between two barrier pairs, we also need to consider that this residual set of one barrier pair is entirely in its, inside the boundary of its adjacent barrier pair. After probably handle this and of concern that we can use our barrier pair RT algorithm to build the barrier pair sequences which connect different human objective regions here. Here, the bigger ellipsoid is the boundary of a barrier pair and the smaller ellipsoid is the residual set. And here, I'm showing you the simulation. But I should tell you, although this is a simulation, but there is a real human operator using the keyboard to control the direction of this red human force at the end factor. So we use the measurement of this end factor force to estimate where the human wants the robot to go to. And then we correctly trigger the barrier pair sequence to move the robot to, the, to that human objective. And by this kind of, uh, by combining the high level human intention inference and the low level barrier pair method, we can successfully solve this human robot share economy problem. With this video, I will end the second part of my dissertation. And from my dissertation, I developed a new model and new control algorithms, which help us to improve the responsiveness and safety for human-centered robots. And here I'm showing you the publications I have so far in my PhD study. So after all these results for human-centered robots, you might be wondering what is the next step for me? Well, so although we have those good model and control algorithm which help us to improve the responsiveness and the safety, but however, if you want to further improve these two things at the same time, at a certain point, we're going to reach a trade-off. Let me use this as a skeleton example again. At that time, actually, I implement very aggressive uh, amplification as a skeleton controller. And this aggressive controller is actually designed for a particular human impedance value. And therefore, if the human impedance is, is exactly that, this, that uh, human impedance we use for the design, the tracking performance is pretty good. But soon after the human operator changes the impedance value, the system becomes unstable. 
the easiest way that we can resolve this issue is to make our controller more conservative, which will bring more robustness back to the system. But however, doing that also means we need to somehow sacrifice the good checking performance you see in the beginning. Therefore, there's a dilemma between whether we want to achieve more responsiveness or more safety guarantee for human-centered robots at a certain point. So the question is, how do we resolve this dilemma? Well, if we cannot use either an aggressive controller or a conservative controller to improve both responsiveness and safety, how about we use them both and let them work together? Therefore, the potential solution in my mind is a two-layer control framework. In the first layer, we use a data-driven method which estimates the hidden human state, such as the impedance, which, and based on this estimation, we can tell which controller is more optimal for the human status. In the second layer, we have a layer of barrier functions, which quantifies the robot capability of maintaining the safety. So, because an inaccurate estimation from the first layer will give us a too aggressive controller and, and potentially violates the safety constraint. Therefore, the barrier function in the second layer can tell us whether we can trust the estimation from the first layer. If we can trust the estimation from the first layer, a more aggressive controller will, adopt, will be adopted. Otherwise, a more conservative controller will be adopted. And throughout my pitch study, I already developed new human models and my safety control algorithms. And this first study result will fill this two-layer control framework. And with this future, with this discussion of the future study, I will end my entire presentation. And thank you so much for listening. I'll give the time back to Louis. All right. Well, thank you, Binghan. So uh, we're going to uh, open the, the floor. Uh, we're going to... Yeah, guys, can you hear me? I see my connection is a little bit unstable. Hello, hello? I can hear you. OK, OK, great. Thank you. So um, let's, let's start with questions from, from the audience, and then we'll move on into uh, uh, private questions from the, from the committee. So audience, uh, except committee, do you guys have any question? All right, so um, in that case, uh, let's go on and uh, have uh, and everyone uh, step out, except the committee, and then we're gonna have the committee asking questions. So thank you all. Okay, let's give it another <clears throat> few seconds. All right. So, uh, uh, Dr. Topku, Chen, Alan Beji, and Wang, who would like to start think, first? So, Luis, I think we, st I think we still have somebody in the in the room. I think Ye and Sun Hyun is still in the room. Okay. I think I can disconnect them. Let me see. Okay, great. I took out. And um, Seon Kyon, are you there? Can you uh, log out? Okay. Perfect. And I'm going to stop the recording also. Uh, give me a second.